Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Alex Cron, and I'm BPSC's Digital Operations and Collections Information Analyst. Here with me today, I have BPSC CEO Nick Honeyset and our colleague Devin Matson as my co-hosts. We have an extra BPSC on hand today as our fearless leader Nick has to bow out a bit early. So thank you everyone for joining us today and welcome to the first episode of BPOC's Dreaming of Digital Asset Management. Um, our webinar series, we, are, we started new this year um, because our series last year, Dreaming of a New Collections Management System was really successful. We invited GLAM professionals to share their experiences with managing collections data, including challenges, opportunities, and what they'd like to see in the field as well as collections management systems in the future. Uh, because the series was so successful um, and because BPOC's work focuses on technology in the cultural heritage field, we decided to expand the conversations to other topics, starting with digital asset management. In the age of COVID, with many organizations expanding their digital operations and programming, digital assets have become more important than ever. So now in today's episode, we have invited Dan Consultants and Educators, Dr. Reem L. Asale, Christina Gibbs, and Christina Hudart to share with us their perspectives on the DAM field. Uh, before I introduce our guest speakers, I would like to mention that we will open up the discussion for Q&A about 10 to 15 minutes before the end. So please put any questions you have in the Q&A section and feel free to comment or have discussions in the chat. Today's session will be recorded. As you know. And if you're having difficulty with the transcription service, please let me know. Now for our speakers. Dr. Reem El Asale is an associate professor at Graphic Communications Management at the Creative School at Ryerson University in Canada. She is a member of Ryerson's graduate studies under the Master of the Digital Media Program and uh, PhD in Media and Design Innovation Programs with the Creative School. Her multidisciplinary knowledge in computer science and graphic communication was shown in her multiple research projects that elaborate around issues that concern the graphic arts industry. Her area of academic interest is in color and imaging science, emerging pre-media technologies and digital asset management. Uh, Dr. El Asale is teaching a unique core undergraduate course in digital asset management at the Creative School, where students from the creative background are learning all fundamentals of DAM while creating an interactive interface that is attractive to the end user. Next, we have Christina Gibbs. After 15 years at the Detroit Institute of Arts, serving primarily as the collections database manager, Christina began a new consulting career in early 2021 with an in-depth digital asset management and collections information reconciliation project for the Smithsonian. She specializes in data and digital asset management, systems integration, and accessibility for people with disabilities in the technology realm. She also partners on projects with consulting firms in the cultural heritage industry, other museums, and software and technology providers. Christina is known for her versatility in being able to move fluidly and fluently from a day spent coding or designing systems integrations to a day spent in concept, vision, and strategy. This end-to-end -end thinking leads to informative uses of data and technology that enables organizations to reach a higher level of functionality that results in measurable impact. And for our final speaker, we have Christina Hudart, who's located in London. She's an independent DAM consultant with over eight years of experience in the DAM industry. She's an experienced agile change manager, project manager, product owner, environmental scientist, and geographer. As a DAM consultant, she provides services for DAM selection and implementation, change management and user adoption, DAM operations, optimization, and instruction for DAM education. Thank you all three of you for being here today. You all three have extensive experience in digital asset management, be it in education or consulting as all three of you teach DAM courses and consulting work inside and outside of the arts and culture field. Um, now, I'd love to hear a bit from each of you about your work, how you got into DAM, how you've seen DAM change over the course of your career, if there are any challenges and opportunities from your experiences that you'd like to share, um, how professionalization of DAM has impacted your work in the field and what you'd like to see going forward into the future. Um, Reem, why don't we start with you and then we'll hear from Christina in London and Christina in Detroit. 
Happy to. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity. I would like just to start by uh, introducing myself again. My name is Reem, uh, Reem Ila Saleh. Um, I am a Middle Eastern uh, woman with um, um, mid-tune uh, skin tone. I'm wearing uh, a floral uh, scarf and a black shirt. My background is a fuzzy uh, a virtual uh, background showing uh, a hole. So um, a little bit about uh, my background and how do I get into the, uh, the dam. I come, uh, as you said, uh, I came from the computer science uh, background and uh, um, my PhD is in paper engineering and imaging uh, science. So I combine um, two different uh, uh, area. Um, I work at uh, the School of Graphics Communication Management at Radisson University in Canada. And for those who doesn't know uh, the uh, GCM, the School of GCM, it's the only uh, school in Canada that could provide fourth uh, year or bachelor degree in printing and packaging uh, technology. It's also part of the uh, the creative school, which is um, a, a faculty that contains the top nine uh, schools in Canada in various uh, creative uh, area like journalism, uh, fashion, pr uh, image uh, image art, photographies, performance, and, uh, and name it. So. As you can see, we come from a creative uh, back, uh, background. My journey with them uh, started 10 years ago when I started with uh, at Ryerson. I was introduced, I was responsible for teaching a course called Advanced Workflow Management, which was a course combined workflow and uh, digital asset uh, management. And then after uh, we updated the curriculum, the this course, the asset management was separated in um, um, like a separate course. Um, it is a fourth year core course at the School of Graphics Communication. It's a unique course because the way that we teach it is really uh, uh, unique. Um, it consists of uh, a lecture and lab. And in the lecture, we teach everything you can think about, uh, about the uh, down fundamental. We, we talked about metadata, we talked about change management, we talked about selecting vendor, we talked about right management, workflow, um, how to select vendor, how, uh, how to, uh, what the consideration you need to do for uh, different uh, uh, or manage asset management, everything. Um, and in the lab, it's a really practical uh, lab. So the student, take the knowledge that they uh, they have from uh, the, uh, the the course and they implement it in the lab. They use um, a dam technology. They build a dam system from scratch for an imaginary company of their choice. And they do it from a back end and a front end. So they have to come up with their metadata scheme. They have to come up with their user permission. They have to come up with the naming system, the automation. So it's, it's really uh, fascinating. Um, and then the second part of the project, they have to build, so we switch the groups. So each group will evaluate the other group dam system while building a marketing campaign for that company, for the new company uh, while doing that. And then they have to present their finding in front of a judging panel consists of experts from um, dam, um, a dam expert from several uh, places. Um, I was fortunate uh, this year uh, in the fall, uh, we have experts coming from different sectors like uh, Warner Media, uh, Maple Leaf Sport, uh, we have Yeti, we have Tyson Foods, so we have a collection of really great uh, speakers. So the students presented uh, their marketing campaign and their evaluation in front of those judges. Um, the second part of uh, the second thing uh, um, project that we do in this course, which is some of you may be familiar with, is the dam creative. Um, because this is a technical uh, course, and because I want to combine the uh, technical course with what um, uh, my student uh, knowledge, their creativity aspect. Um, so I ask the student to pick a topic from uh, the course and then they dig into more research and then they have to re-represent it in a creative way. Uh, so we they came up with games, they came up with one down video, they come up with infographies um, and we have a showcase that uh, is uh, also there. Um, and I start to post the best work on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn. Um, so that's gained a lot of uh, interaction. Um, the 
I have faced a couple of challenges during my uh, my journey. Uh, the first challenge was is uh, the lack of learning material or resources. Because when I started with with them, it was really hard for me to find really good resources. So, um, multiple resources in one place, or providing a reading material for students to uh, to learn about. I did find a couple of books, but each book like focus on one area than uh, another. So it was a little bit uh, difficult for me. And um, that's why that was one of the motivation why I came up with the dumb creative uh, assignment. And because we uh, we communicate with the graphics. Uh, so uh, that's the other thing I want to find videos or infographic that will be what give me the information in like one minute. Uh, so that uh, that was the uh, the thing. Uh, the other challenge that I also face is um, it was really hard for me to find people who working on the digital asset management, especially in Canada. Um, so until and I don't want to say thank you to COVID, but actually because of COVID, I had the opportunity to attend Henry Seward event virtual. Uh, and since 2020, when when the whole thing uh, happened, I almost attend every single event workshop courses in Henry Seward, including the the current um, workshop. I'm a student of uh, Christina from London. Uh, she's doing a course in change management, so I am uh, her, uh, her student. Um, so that was uh, fortunate for me, and it's also provided me with the opportunity to meet people. And because all of that, um, I actually work with uh, David Lipsy in organizing the Canada Coast to Coast event. Um, which we started last year and we're going to continue uh, this year. We come, we bring people working on digital asset management in several Canadian companies to present their um, uh, their expertise, share their expertise. We had also a couple of keynote uh, talk. Christina Gibbs from Detroit was one of our guest speakers. Um, so there is a connection between all of us. Um, and it was well received, so that's why we're going to do it again uh, this year. Uh, we also have a couple of uh, workshops also uh, along uh, the way. What do I see uh, them is uh, going and what I'm hoping uh, to see? More learning uh, resources. I do see a lot of different, uh, the, like the, um, the momentum of learning about them is increasing. Uh, and because of the virtual uh, world, uh, that make it easy for a lot of people to actually uh, learn about that. So um, I would like to see more uh, of that. And um, I want to say, um, stay tuned for the new generation of uh, the DAM. We have really great students. I have, um, I'm, I'm fortunate also enough to be the um, faculty advisor of a student who's doing a graduate research on digital asset. Uh, management. So there is a momentum. Uh, uh, there is a momentum uh, there. So that's what that's my experience. Thank you, Ray. Really appreciate that. I'm going to hand it over to Christina in London now. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Hadart, um, and I'm learning how to do this description. So I am a woman. Uh, I have long uh, blonde hair. I'm wearing a gray blazer and uh, dark rimmed glasses, uh, need those for reading. And behind me in the background, uh, I've got some bookshelves with a lot of plants that I've been uh, cultivating, including a pothos, which has now uh, made its way over to a, uh, a frame behind me. Uh, and that's a, that if anyone recognizes that, that is the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, it's a bathymetry of the Chesapeake Bay where I grew up. So I grew up in Maryland. And even though I'm based in London now, um, I still have my roots in the US. And uh, so hello from everyone in North, North America that's joining us today. Um, so if you don't know me, I think Alex already gave a pretty good description, but what I do now is I'm an independent dam consultant uh, and I help companies and cultural heritage organizations to find, implement, and make the most of their dam practices. Um, I've been working in the dam industry for 
coming up on nine years now. Uh, soon it'll be a decade before you know it. <laughs> um, and like Alex said, I actually came from a, a background of environmental science. So unlike Reem, uh, who comes from computer science background, which I didn't know Reem, that's exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, my background's very different, uh, but interestingly, my, my knowledge and understanding of databases um, is what helped me find um, a common theme when I got into DAM. Um, and I've, I've worked in sectors uh, across from startups, wellness, financial services, energy, and of course, the cultural heritage sector. I started out in my DAM career at um, Kew Gardens. So being an environmental scientist, not really knowing what DAM was nine years ago now, um, when I, and that was when I first moved to the UK, I, um, I found this job <clears throat> at Kew Gardens, which is, if you don't know it, it's a, an enormous, very famous uh, botanical garden here in London. Um, and it was for DAM. And I honestly had no idea what DAM was. So I did all the Googling I possibly could. And nine years ago, there really weren't many resources out there. And like Reem has said that, you know, the educational materials and what we can access now is, uh, has grown so much over time. Um, but yeah, so I did my little bit of research that I could, found out as much as I could about it, and then went into this interview. And, um, and the lovely, lovely people at Kew Gardens um, were absolutely amazing with me. They were really patient. And I, and I said, look, this is what I know about DAM, but honestly, um, you know, I'm just really good with scientists. I'm really good with plants. Um, and, you know, I'd love to work here. What can I do to, to make this work? And, um, and they were wonderful and they, they did admit they couldn't pay me much, but they could put me on to any courses or conferences that existed at the time. So that's how I got introduced to the Henry Stewart conference uh, circuit. So for any of you who are really new to DAM and also for those of you who um, have been in DAM for a while, you probably already have heard about the Henry Stewart events, but do check them out. They're absolutely incredible. And it's a great place to meet the community and get together. Um, Alex, I can go on, but what do you want me to focus on? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if you could just talk about, like, I know you talked about your experiences with Kew Gardens, if um, there were any challenges that you had during that time um, outside of finding, you know, resource materials for learning how to manage digital assets. Um, I know that that is a big challenge and I'm so thrilled to see coursework and certification in DAM now. Um, but yeah, just just um, about that a bit more. Sure, sure. So, um, so it's interesting because a lot of the challenges that we had nine years ago um, at Q, uh, what I was doing there at the time was I was brought in to select um, and implement a new dam system. Uh, they had had a legacy dam system that they'd been using for many years, primarily for imagery, and they wanted to move to a more modern um, technology and also use it to manage um, their video assets, all of their digitized um, herbarium specimens, as well as their um, digitized herbal literatures and artworks. Um, so a lot more assets were going in um, at the time. So there was a lot to do in terms of selection at the time. And, um, and I, I've seen, of course, that's a, a similar process that we're all still going through now. Um, and so over the years, I've worked um, my way through a couple different cultural heritage organizations. So I worked with historic royal palaces, and I was lucky enough to work at Hampton Court Palace. Um, which is where Henry VIII uh, was based, and it's actually not too far from where I live now. Uh, and I also worked at the Royal Horticultural Society, again, really just focusing on dam selection and implementation, but also getting into, like Reem is doing as well, those creative workflows um, and creative operations and how to um, also roll out the dam and do change management and user adoption um, 
and bring people along on the journey. And that's um, that's the course I'm teaching now. So if anyone's interested in learning more about how to get users to actually adopt the system or how to get leadership buy-in, um, that's a course I'm teaching now. And I think, um, I think Alex can share the links to that. Um, and another thing that I'm seeing uh, a challenge across the industry now, and now I work with, um, like I said, also cultural heritage organizations, but also bigger corporates, and they all struggle with the same issues. So don't feel don't feel like you're um, you know you're you're missing out on what corporates are doing. You know everyone's moving at a pretty slow pace and taking it um, one step at a time and making sure that they have the damn foundations right. And something that um, that we see a lot is companies. Uh, I get companies that come to me and they say, hey, you know what, we've had this dam for three to five years. We've had it for a little while now. I don't think it's working for us anymore. And, um, and a really interesting uh, thing that I've started doing now is working with companies on their dam operations and optimization. And that's around the idea of um, doing a full analysis to understand what's happening with your system? Um, what's happening with your dam practice? Because there's the combination of the technology, of course, but you've also got the people that use it and have to leverage the tools, um, the workflows and the processes around it, and also the data. So there are lots of different elements working together. And if one of those is off kilter, then yeah, you're going to be struggling with your dam and uh, people are going to say, well, I can't find anything or this isn't working. Um, and and so it's about getting to the root cause of what is happening in the organization. And um, I like to do that usually as kind of like an annual health check. And it's something that I recommend once you have a dam for hopefully some of you on the on the um, in participating today have a dam already and if you're noticing any um, symptoms or kind of side effects like this, then it's worth doing an annual health check and just seeing, digging into the details, see what's going on with it. Um, so that's some of the, the challenges that I'm seeing. Of course, there's also challenges around integrations with other systems um, and then some opportunities around uh, AI. So I'm actually doing a, writing an article and doing some research right now on dam and artificial intelligence, which is a really exciting space. Um, and I'd love to hear from the audience, like, what are your challenges? What do you want to talk about? Um, and then when it comes to uh, the professionalization of DAM, yeah, like Reem and Christina, I'm really excited about all of the courses that are now available and the different ways to learn. Um, and something that Christina and I are doing is, um, oh, that was Nick going, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were waving, so let me know I'm doing something. Maybe I'm on mute. <laughs> no, no, you're good, Christina. I was just <laughs> saluting our fearless leader. Oh, um, yeah. So in terms of uh, new courses, uh, there's also um, Christina and I are uh, on the faculty at Rutgers University. Um, there, there's a new professional dam certificate. So for those of you who are already uh, practicing dam and you've got full time dam jobs and you want to um, develop your career and get to that next level or maybe learn um, a specific part about dam that you've not explored yet, uh, check out the Rutgers dam professional dam certificate program um the the course that i'm doing is dam for glam so uh hopefully if any of you are interested in in upskilling in um dam specifically for cultural heritage come along to to that course i love that name and thank you christina <laughs> I, I i especially appreciate the advice that you've given for the audience today um and now last but certainly not least i'm going to hand it over to christina in detroit Hello, I'm Christina Gibbs in Detroit. Um, I go by pronouns she and her. I have long dark hair piled on top of my head. I'm wearing some gold earrings with some stones in them. I'm wearing a black v-neck dress with a gold chain necklace. Uh, in my background, I have a print by a local artist named Mary Fortuna. 
Um, it's a woodcut with dark blue crows and branches with, I think, I think they're peaches, but orange fruits. Um, so yeah, like Reem and Christina, we could talk for forever, I think. <laughs> um, so it's really interesting, and this isn't a secret, but I've only been a consultant for just over a year now. Um, so it's been a really wild ride. It's been very challenging, um, a lot of fun, frightening, really rewarding, kind of everything. Um, so I think I'll start with how I got into DAM. As Alex mentioned, I worked at the Detroit Institute of Arts for almost 15 years. About seven or eight years ago, we finally got buy-in. I think, yeah, about eight years ago, I was assistant registrar handling acquisitions, de-acquisitions, and trying to manage the collections database in my spare time. So um, it was a lot of work and I had to learn a lot quickly, like learning crystal reports and just I knew things could be a lot more efficient. So, um, and I had really good support at the time. So, um, so I learned a lot, but anyway, collectively, a bunch of different departments um, got enough buy-in to bring consultants in to DIA for, for a day and talk about um, collections access specifically. We knew we wanted to publish our entire collection on online onto the website and that's when I first heard about dam they're like you need a dam too and a dam manager um, I was like oh I guess I should learn this stuff so um but we were successful that's when I was promoted to be um, a full-time database manager and we moved into the publications department we were able to acquire our first dam and our first dam manager who is uh Jessica Herseg Konesny, who is now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, we did a lot, a lot of work together. Um, and Jessica got really great buy-in to end up getting uh, enterprise wide down. And so between the two of us, we worked to do two different system integrations. Um, the second one involved building an API. I didn't build it, another outside vendor did, but we did all the communication. I designed all the SQL database views to pull, if anyone's familiar with the museum system or any collections management, there's lots of tables. So, and everyone uses the system differently. So I made a bunch of different formulas to display data how we want, you know, like the artist and the bio and the dates and if, when do this kind of thing. So um, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. Um, and so, I don't know exactly when, but I need, knew I needed to expand my knowledge and about other systems and technological ecosystems. Um, so I took a vacation and I went to the Henry Stewart Conference in Chicago and just learned and talked to people and um, all of that kind of stuff. Um, then later, Jessica and I have spoke at Henry conferences, Henry Stewart conferences and um, MCN. So that's been really enjoyable. Um, so that's how I started learning um, and then started guest lecturing and now I'm part of faculty at Rutgers with Christina. Um, I can <laughs> definitely vouch that Dam for Glam is an excellent course. I was honored to be able to be the TA, I think a year ago. Um, it was a really wonderful experience and it's, it's just a great class. Like, I think what I learned too about working and doing my job is, um, and I have a degree in actually making fine art. So all this technology is completely self-taught. So I didn't come with that vocabulary of like reading computer science. I like, you know, I have to learn all the vocabulary. So you're doing these things and you're writing database views and migrating data and all this kind of stuff, but you don't know how to talk about it. So that was the first step I really needed to take was to learn how to talk about what I do and translate those skills. And that was just very, crucial for me to be able to jump into starting my own consultancy. Um, so if anyone needs any guidance with that, please, please let me know. I'm not an expert, <laughs> but I'm willing to share my experience. And similar to Christina, I, I am doing some work in definitely the cultural heritage sector. I just taught the digital asset management capability model, which as Christina mentioned, that can be a tool used to do your annual health check. 
Um, and it's a lot of fun. I just worked with this small institution and they're just so ready for dam. They don't have a dam yet. So um, it's really exciting and they're very passionate about it. And um, I'm gonna jump around a little bit on that note. I'm gonna move to a trend that I'm seeing now. Um, you know, museum started in dam what do we want to say, maybe 10 years ago, somewhere around that? Um, and I would say, I think, and I could be totally, totally wrong because I don't have any statistics or data for this, but I think, I feel like a lot of us started on like these dinky dams, right? We were just doing basic dam. There was hardly any reporting. Configuration was lacking, that kind of thing. So that was like, for instance, of the DIA, the current dam system, our, our current setup couldn't handle video. So that was one easy kind of buy-in to get an enterprise um, dam system. Um, but I think it's fun because I know that there's still a lot of museums out there that don't have dam at all. And so we've been saying um, a lot of museums can now jump the curve. They don't have to start with that dinky dam and go through all that pain of another migration and another integration. They can just jump the curve and just step right in. And museums and cultural heritage organizations have shared so much knowledge. Everyone's really just ready to talk to you about their experiences and lessons learned. And um, so now I think, and especially obviously with COVID and the pandemic, making things digital is just has to happen. Um, so I think it's a little easier to get buy-in, a little easier to get funding, at least I'm hoping. Alex, what else can I help you with? <laughs> no, that, that's perfect. Thank you, Christina, I appreciate that. Um, we actually do have a question in the Q&A, so if we want, we can, we can jump ahead to that. Um, I think this is a great question for all three of you. From Travis, he's asking, do you have any strategies for recruiting a dams professional to manage a system? And feel free to you know, jump right in if you wanna go ahead and answer that. I can say if you want to go all out, you can require the Rutgers professional certificate as a job requirement. <laughs> and um, Christina, didn't wasn't there one? Uh, I think it was a corporation that actually listed it in their job description or their job posting. So. That's right. Yes, it's starting to become to catch on a little bit to to require certifications. So for other for other um type jobs you would normally need some sort of certifications and um and now that there is the rutgers um professional certificate or um uh, like a bachelor's uh with ream um you know there are these certificates and there are these qualifications now available and um i think that employers are starting to learn about those and they're they are showing up on job descriptions a lot more now I can't agree more. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think something oh, else sorry. in terms of um, like skills to look for. What I found is that dam is one of these like chameleon jobs. You need to be a little bit of everything, and um, and I mean for me, that's one of the things I love about dam is that I'm constantly learning, and I never feel like I know. Um, like all of the things I need to know. So um, for example, if you're working with creatives, it's really helpful to have a background as a graphic designer or at least understand um, the lingo around InDesign or um, other sorts of um, you know, video publishing workflows, um, all of these different kind of uh, things are going to be really helpful. Um, I've also found in my career that um, certifications in uh, project management, product ownership, and then now change management have also been really useful. Um, not, not necessarily sought after in the job description specifically, but they've helped me to upskill and to be able to do um, do my job a little bit better. Even business analysis is really helpful. 
Reem, are you going to jump in too? Exactly. I'm going to jump in. Uh, so this is exactly why it was a little bit easy for my students to learn about them. Now, given the fact that they introduced to the dam in fourth year, so that's the last year uh, of them, but they have that background. So, those, so they have the foundation of the creative background. So they know in design, illustrative, video, all of that. And as part of the core course, they have to take uh, project management courses. So they have the business uh, management courses. They have the creativity courses. And what I do in my, uh, my course, I throw the technical terms in there because I use my knowledge in computer science database. I talk, there are actually uh, one lecture that we discuss IT infrastructure. So I throw the networking, the server, the fireworks, so all, all of those technical time. And uh, the reason that I keep telling my students, you need to know, you need to make yourself familiar with those them because at the end you will either going to be working in a company that is going to require for a dam. So maybe you're going to be part of that team or you're going to be working in a vendor who's providing them to uh, to people, which means that you need to be become familiar of those terms. So I, I agree with you, Christina, you need to get at least you know something from everything. And that's the beauty of uh, the digital asset management. So if you know all of those terms, if you are familiar with those terms, you actually can go, um, go through. Thank you. Um you guys have talked a lot, or especially the Christinas have talked a lot about dam adoption. Um, I was wondering if you guys had maybe any advice for people who their organization does not have a digital asset management system or you know, dam practices in their policies, if you have any recommendations or advice as to how they could get buy-in from their organization to start implementing policies or you know, purchasing and implementing a new digital asset management system. Yeah, buy-in is a really is a really unique or kind of specific thing depending on your leaders. So uh, the first thing to do is to get to know your leadership. Who are they? What motivates them? What are your companies or your organizations' missions and um, uh, objectives for this year for next year? And then what you want to do is start tying back. Um, dam to those to and align dam to that vision. So, for example, if you're working with a museum and your vision for the next year, um, or your leadership's vision for the next year, is that you're going to have a beautiful 3D digital experience walking tour. That sounds awesome. Great. Okay, now you need to think about what goes into that. How do you make that work? And this is where you can start to build your business case for DAM and get that buy-in. So if you break it down, you can say, well, we what do we do with the 3D um, assets once they're created? These are huge files. Um, they're extremely valuable uh, because it's going to cost you a lot to create them. And you don't want to lose them. You want to protect them somewhere securely. And you'll also need to be able to feed them to the web digital experience um, in a, in a you know, highly scalable way that's very quick. So people aren't waiting on their phones for the for the app to load, that sort of thing. So um, you'll need DAM as the, as the basis, as the foundation of that digital experience. And without it, you're going to really struggle. You might be able to set it up, but you won't be able to replicate that year after year. So, um, you know, you'll want to do another uh, slightly different tour, perhaps of a specific exhibition the following year, and you'll have to do all of that manually without a dam. So um, now's the time to start think, to start talking to, to your leadership about what do they want to do in the next few years. And how can DAM support that and tie that all back? That's one of the ways I've found most effective. But Reem and Christina, what have you found? Yeah, absolutely. It's tying everything to your vision or mission or your strategic goals for the year is, it's really actually easy to do because we're museums and we want to share um, assets and our experience and our collection. Um, so it's it seems daunting, but once you start, it's, it starts to come to you, especially yeah, when you have those strategic goals lined up. 
um, the very basic question is, if we had down, like, this is how we're doing things now, if we had down, this is how um, we would be more efficient or the benefit, the return on investment um, or initiative. So you can start documenting those specific use cases. Um, and then after you build your use cases, then that can help inform your requirements list. And then finally your RFP out to vendors. So that's basically it. Um, I'm still obviously a fan of the DAM capability model as well. Um, we did, yeah, we, we did bring in David Lipsy to the DIA and we did that and we got the CFO to the table. We got IT to the table, marketing, you know, someone from everywhere because Dan was all different. And we went through and mapped out, you know, where we were digitally, where we wanted to go. And um, yeah, if you have your CFO at the table and they get it, it's very, very helpful. <laughs> it doesn't always happen, but um, yeah, I think that's it. It, it's the David Lipsy magic. It's David Lipsy magic. Um, I want to add. Uh, I want to add one more uh, thing. So yes, uh, with the Christina from London, it's once you understand what is your goal, what is your trying to achieve, it will be really easy to actually tweak and um, implement or get the buy-in of the dam. I found it a little bit uh, difficult because um, in my cases, we do, as I mentioned, we do have several uh, creative uh, program, but not all of them implemented a dam uh, system. And when you try to uh, like, talk about them, the idea that they have, which is unfortunate for now, that it is a software that you use it to organize asset, not then what? So we, so now it's, uh, and, and this is actually one of the, my uh, long term is to change that idea. Dam is not just a software that you use to just organize your asset. It's part of a big workflow. And this is one of the uh, new integration or the momentum integration that it damn used to be a standalone software, but not anymore. It's part of a workflow. I'm, I'm using a new term. Dam is a glue between all of us. Dam is a glue between different uh, work, workflow systems. So if they understand that, if they got this idea, then we can get that buy-in. So again, it's built based on how you're going to represent it. How is that going to connect it to your uh, goal, to your um, business objective? You will get that uh, buy uh, buy-in. And Thank to you. kind of add to that, um, uh, what Reem was saying is really interesting. And also what Christina was saying about getting the CFO to the table and getting your executives to the table. It's um, DAM is something that isn't familiar to executives and leadership. So you say digital asset management or DAM, and they're going to say, "What is that? We don't need it." Um, and I and it's not like it's not like saying, "Oh, we need an email automation tool." You know, that's pretty common. People know what that is, or we need a website, or we need Twitter. Um, you know that the, the the DAM still isn't something that is talked about in the mainstream because it's one of these background foundational tools that um, we sometimes overlook because we just, we need it. We all need it, but we expect it to be there. Um, so it's, it's a matter of education as well. So getting the right people in the room and explaining to them what DAM is. I mean, that's a really good place to start, you know, before you ask for the budget <laughs> and say, hey, we need some money for this thing called DAM. And they're going to say, nah, what's that? Um, get them into a room and, and um, run a workshop. Um, you know, ask, ask somebody um, like us to come and join you and, and to share how DAM actually powers all of these other um, things like digital experience, like your website, um, you know, and, and what happens when you don't have DAM um, and, you know, the potential side effects of that. Um, I think the education piece is a big one because we, we just can't assume that everyone knows what DAM is, even if we do. <laughs> 
Can I add also one more thing? It's something that I learned from uh, my uh, my professor Christina in the change management. Um, it's that people they one of the things that why people they don't like the idea of adapting them. The fear of um, if they implemented that software or if they added that software on uh, their work or on or that is going to change uh, the way that they're going to do the work or maybe people they are not going to think about them that they are a valuable uh, anymore once you uh, start adding those adaptations. So again, implementing change management, it will take a while. Um, so even after you convince the CEO of the, um, the value of uh, them, it's actually turned to the people, the stakeholder who's going to use it uh, because okay let's get let's see we get the funding we get the investment but if if the people doesn't use it there's no value of the dam so you have to do implement the change management i did i get this correctly yes i'm a good student you're a star student Reem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely Reem. yeah definitely your user stakeholders if you get some champions on the ground with you it's really really helpful and one last point at least from the museum perspective and working all the work I did closely with Jessica, the former dam manager there, um, we would talk about the dam as similar to collections information to our collections database. So the collections database is the authority for knowledge and information about the collection, right? We're not going to put acquisition and accession and provenance and exhibition information into the dam, but similar our digital assets that are being reproduced from our collection are just as important and critical and they need their own system. So that's the authority system for digital assets about the collection. Uh, so yeah, we have plenty of graphs or charts that show that they're equal, <laughs> you know, we need both. You know, a, a museum's not gonna say like, well, why, why do we need a collections database? that's over we get it so it, you know the same is going to happen with down is it just it becomes a thing that is some excellent adoption advice from the three of you thank you um we actually have a few more questions from an audience member um they sent three so i'm just going to read them one at a time uh with the requirement of having to a lot of have a lot of skills how do you handle the massive workload that dams management comes with It's a big question. I can start. Um, and I've actually never been a dam manager, so I'm just going from what I've experienced and have learned. Um, and Jessica did this great too. You're not doing it alone. You have all your users and you get your governance committee together. That's a whole team of people and you do a metadata standards committee. So you're not doing all the work alone. Um, that's where I would. Definitely start. Yeah, I love that, Christina. You're right. You're not alone. It, it may feel like that, I think, when you're kind of that um, what one person show uh, and it does feel like it can pile on. Um, you'll What you'll find, too, is that it doesn't have to always be that way. You know, you can you, you, you need to ask for help when you when you don't have capacity anymore. Do ask for help. Um, it's not, it's not, it, it's not necessary that it has to be a one person job. Um, and it shouldn't be really, because there's a lot of different elements to it. Um, and a lot of different skills that it's, it's almost impossible to find one person that can do all of these different things. Um, you know, because on one hand, for example, you need to be very technical and, and, um, and very focused on detail and attend and paying attention to detail for data management for the metadata management um, and then on the other side you also need to be a real people person so that you can get stakeholders on board um, and sometimes you can't find somebody who is both of those things at once um, so ask for help you know we do we are seeing that not only in large corporations but also in the museum sector we are seeing bigger teams of um, dam managers. So you'll have dam librarians, um, change managers, data management, um, you know, and, and sometimes that's, that is merged with the collections management team. 
Um, you know, same with collections management, you know, you'll notice that that's not usually just one person. There are, there is a, a team around it uh, and DAM is the same kind of thing. And like Christina said, you're not alone. Um, you've got all of your stakeholders and, um, uh, you know, or your your um, change network, which um, we fondly referred to as damn ambassadors, um, the people around you that can help you. And that's been really useful for me, even working with large corporations. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with companies with 80,000 employees. There's no way that you're going to get around and train everybody, right? So um, you need you need support, you need buy-in from departments, you need super users in those departments to help you out. Um, so there are ways of doing it. Yeah, you gotta be a little bit creative sometimes, but um, but don't don't let all the pressure sit on your shoulders. That, that, that's not really fair. Mm -hmm. This is actually what I do with the students. So even with a small educational part with a small, uh, project it's a it's a group project so the student don't build the dam by itself because as you said it's required a lot of people to buy in and so i can't add uh, anything more so if, if if it's from the education part we teach the student that this is a teamwork then of course in the professional life it's going to be a teamwork mm -hmm. i might get add something christine you were talking about training yeah if you can think about ways to automate training so record your screen as you're giving the basic intro to your dam system and send that link out instead of hosting all these training sessions if that fits into your cultural um culture there at your museum you might want to be face to face with everyone and that's absolutely fine too but you can think about ways to automate onboarding and you know online work requests forms um things like that so the second question, I think all three of you actually touched on, but if there's anything that you want to expand on, um, the second question is, is there a proper way to distribute this type of work to prevent reliance on a single person to, to complete the dam's work? Yeah, I, I think we, we already answered that one, so I'll move on to the third question. Um, how do you make a dam more sustainable in terms of maintaining it over time at an institution with limited resources and shrinking budgets. Hmm. It's a little bit more. <laughs> I'm still in the con conceptual phase of learning how to talk about this, but um, yeah, shrinking budgets. If you can prove over time, let's say you did get by it, you got it down. You absolutely have to have a dam manager to make it sustainable. You cannot, as Christian always says, it's not one and done. It's continually evolving. So you have to have a dam manager to manage a system. Same with any other system. Um, see, what the, where was I going with that? Oh, that's what it is. So over time, if you can document these wins and the return on investments and kind of document and show that it's actually saving you money or um, the, let's say you brought your gift shop online into DAM and we're using DAM to power the gift shop online and you're generating sales through reproductions or what have you. Um, and you show, DAM can pay for itself. So it's a big thing to take on and to think about um, and do, but it can, I, I believe it can pay for itself. So that's one way. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with you on that, Christina. The, um, you definitely need a, a dam manager, at least one, uh, if not more, more people to manage this. And, and when I get this question, because of course, everyone's got, you know, tech tightening budgets at some point. So you get this question a lot. Um, I like to use the analogy of, of a website, right? Would you ever, would your company ever set up a website and then just say, okay, we're done now and it'll run itself? <laughs> no, right? It needs constant support. It needs updating. It needs new content. It needs um, somebody to 
uh, manage taking down old pages, um, adding new new things. It's it is a constant job, and you'll see the website team is growing. Um, and the same with Dam. Dam is all about your content. Your content is growing. If anything, you're creating more images, more videos, um, probably some other interesting um, asset types that you hadn't had before than ever. And if you're storing all of those in your dam, which I hope you are, and if you're not, maybe that's the first thing to think about, um, then your dam will be invaluable because it, it holds all of those assets. Um, so there will be buy-in, and if there's not, have that conversation and use the website analogy because again, even if um, your, your uh, executives don't quite understand the concept of DAM, everybody seems to be able to understand how a website works. So use that analogy if you can. I can add, I can add to, to both of Christina. So beside all of that, if there is an implemented governance plan that actually control um, how many times the or how frequent you need to update your metadata, how frequent you need to update your uh, keywords. So for example, languages is changing every year. Something that was acceptable uh, 10 years ago is not acceptable now. So that means that you need to frequently take a look and revisit your metadata, revisit uh, your keyword and revisit. Um, your workflow. Um, so there is, if, if there is like a really good, suitable government uh, governance uh, plan that is going to ensure that your dam will be sustainable over the years, and and that is something else as beside everything both Christine has men mentioned. Yeah, I have um thinking about the funding and um getting buy-in together here's i can just run through a quick example um like to your executive team say they want to digitize a specific collection of the archives and they realize the value of that and for digitization you can get grant money but that grant application is going to ask you what are you doing with the assets afterwards where are you storing them how are you going to preserve them and if you can't answer that question you're not going to get some funding so that's a good one <laughs> We have a few minutes left and we have one more question. Um, let's hope we can get to that. Um, how do you assess where dams should be in your organization? Is it in IT? Is it in the imaging department, uh, collections or the library? You mean in physical? I think more of ownership. Where I'm understanding the question correctly. Where should Dam report? Mm -hmm. The age old question. <laughs> oh, do, do, do any museums have um, kind of a digital team? Because um, I'm wondering, I, I'd like to, you know, eventually you want your dam to be an enterprise system. So, um, you know, naturally, of course, maybe it's one department that starts out with the idea and says, hey, we need a dam. And that that's perhaps where it's implemented. So sometimes it's collections. I've seen it in um, marketing teams and communication teams um, and cultural heritage organizations. Um, that's usually it will start in one department, but eventually when you get to the point where it needs to be an enterprise system and you need the other teams to start not only adopting the system, but also starting to pay for the system, uh, then you probably want to try and move the ownership to um, some, so, some sort of kind of higher level, whether that's digital or I don't know what, um, what those roles are called um, in museums now. Hopefully those are all evolving as well. But um, yeah, I think, I think it, it grows and changes over time. That's a good question, though. <laughs> I love that Where question. Yeah, that's one of my favorite questions, and always kind of a always kind of a mystery too. And Christine, I would have answered it exactly as you do. It can move around and then become more centralized over time. Um, mm -hmm. 
Hearing but not it. IT. I would say not. Don't let it sit in IT. <laughs> well, the IT have some part of it, but no, yes, oh, yeah. that's not not the IT. Most likely, maybe it's. It, again, I believe I think it's depend on the organization. So if it's a museum, there will be a digital department. But most of organization, I would think that is going mostly start with the marketing uh, mm -hmm. department, and then as as you said, is going to spread uh, everywhere. But I think it's depend on the. Um, organization that's what i believe yeah i i did um i have a fun story um i know we have a minute left but um i worked with an organization where uh dam started in the um textile conservation team uh which was a really odd fit um but i i believe it's still going now and i think it's moved out of that team um but but hey you know wherever it starts um, is a good place to start and uh, and hopefully it will it will move and become a, a bigger enterprise system. Yeah. And I mean this costs more money, but you don't always have to have one dam. Your marketing team could have a different dam than your collections and libraries and archives depending on functionality. So that's I just talked to a university a couple of days ago and they have nine dams. <laughs> one digital preservation system and nine downs. And they decided that's okay because marketing wants this, blah, 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 you know? So there's a, the limit that options are limitless. They might need a damn health check, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately we are out of time. So it many thanks to all three of you for participating in our webinar series. It's so lovely to have had this opportunity for you to join us. Uh, thank you everyone for attending, listening to the recording. Um, next month we have episode two, Dam Without a Dams, coming April 7th. Uh, please follow us on social media or sign up for our newsletter if you'd like to be kept informed of the future webinars. I wish everyone a fabulous week and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Care. Thanks everyone. Thank you.